Senator George Mitchell, for those who don't know him yet, or haven't heard of him, served as a US Senator from the state of Maine, our state, from 1980 to 1995, and as a Senate Majority Leader from 1989 to 1985. For his role in forging the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, he received the National Constitution Center's Liberty Medal, as well as the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In accepting the former award, he opined, I believe there's no such thing as a conflict that cannot be ended, or can't be ended. They are created and sustained by human beings. They can be ended by human beings, no matter how ancient the conflict, no matter how hateful, no matter how hurtful, peace can prevail. So with these inspiring words, please help me welcome <laughs> President Charles Mitchell to the podium. Thank you very much, Anwar, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this evening and for your uh, warm reception. I was born and raised in the state of Maine, and so it is with great pride that I join you here in Tangier at a college based in Maine. My congratulations to Anwar Majid, to President Ribich, to the students and faculty from New England, the University of New England, who are making this remarkable institution an international success. I couldn't help thinking today that I have a home in Maine on the coast, and I look eastward and I see the Atlantic Ocean and then some islands, and if I could see far enough, I would have seen Tangier. So today I stood on the balcony of the hotel where I'm staying looking in the opposite direction and I tried to see my home but I couldn't quite get it over the horizon but it was nice to know that it's there. Uh, I do speak often, many times. Uh, so for me the highlight of the program is the introduction. And uh, I want to thank Anwa for a very, very generous introduction. Uh, and I thank all of you for coming. I'm going to speak uh, for a few minutes about uh, the Middle East and peace. Uh, and then I'll be glad to take your questions. Today, on television news and in social media, there are many who comment that the world is falling apart, it's more dangerous than ever, and the United States is declining at home and abroad. I disagree on all counts. Fear of the future, complaining about the present, are as old as human civilization. The word democracy is a Greek word, a combination of two ancient Greek words, demos, the people, kratzi, the rule of. Over a period of several hundred years, the Greek city-states went through a long transition from dictatorship to oligarchy to an early form of democracy. In the year 550 before Christ, one member of a ruling family wrote, gone is faith, no one any longer reveres God, the generation of religious men is no more. Those words sound like some current comments about the loss of traditional values. The man who wrote those words was deeply troubled by the idea that ordinary citizens would be able to share in the governance of their society. He regarded democracy as a threat, a radical departure from past tradition, a danger to the whole society. Today, 2,500 years later, democracy 
still faces challenges. The world was dangerous then, it still is. In the 20th century, an estimated 100 million people were killed in wars. In a world in which the population was only about one third of what it is today. Each death of a human being in conflict is a tragedy. But today the deaths are in the dozens and the scores. In the 20th century, particularly during the First and Second World Wars, they often were in the hundreds, the thousands, and on some especially tragic days, in the tens of thousands. That could happen again if another world war breaks out. But although it's possible, I don't think it's likely. Because of the military dominance of the United States and its allies. Although no worldwide war is likely, undoubtedly there will continue to be local and regional conflicts and they will have devastating impacts upon the people whose lives are affected. In the coming decades, it will become increasingly clear that the long period of relative stability that followed the Second World War has come to an end. Throughout history, many conflicts involve religious differences, but there always were other factors as well. As Pope Francis noted recently in a speech, throughout human history, the drive for political power by ambitious and often ruthless men has often been disguised as a religious endeavor. Across a wide portion of the globe, from South Asia to India, from the Middle East and across Africa, in the coming decades, populations will grow very rapidly. Much of that growth will take place in countries that are already not able to meet the basic needs of their people, many struggling with widespread corruption and the absence of an effective rule of law. The political history of the Middle East in recent years provides insight into recent and future problems. For more than four centuries, what we now call the Middle East was ruled by the Ottoman Empire based in Turkey. When that empire collapsed in the aftermath of the First World War, Britain and France, the colonial powers, effectively divided up control of the region. Some of the political boundaries that they created did not reflect the history or the interests of the people who actually lived in the Middle East. That order lasted nearly a century, but is now collapsing under the weight of region-wide dissatisfaction, mistrust, and violence. All of these factors are magnified by religious differences. Islam is now torn by internal conflicts, some of which overlap and intersect. Some date from the colonial and post-World War I period. Others go all the way back to the seventh century and the political competition to succeed the Prophet Muhammad, which led to the division between Sunni and Shia. That division has been marked by alternating periods of remission, little conflict, and then expansion and violent conflict. It is now intense and expanding. Saudi Arabia and Iran, the leaders of the two groups, are increasingly hostile toward one another. Conflicts in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, and others, have inflamed the Sunni-Shia split with catastrophic consequences for the people of those countries. Radical extremists like ISIS want to impose, not just on people in the Muslim world, but people everywhere, a rigid form of Islam as they claim it was practiced 
during the life of the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. One result has been massive upheaval in the region and the greatest movement of people across national boundaries since the Second World War. But as the flood of immigrants from the Middle East and Africa demonstrates, what most people in the Muslim world want is what most people everywhere want, a stable and a secure society, a decent job, a home, a, ch a chance to get their children off to a good start in life. The current upheaval is likely to continue for decades and will have uneven results. While what has happened in many countries since the Arab Spring are disappointing to many, there are some exceptions. In Tunisia, democracy has a fragile foothold. Here in Morocco, the royal family is charting a course for what some call democratization within monarchy. To those in the West who are impatient or condescending to the pace of change in the Middle East, we should not forget that Europe was shaped by centuries of conflict. In France, more than a half century elapsed from the time of revolution to the modern republic. In England, hundreds of years of conflict. Today, the United States has treaties with countries all around the world. Among the U.S. commitments is a guarantee to Israel's right to exist within safe and defensible borders. The United States also supports the creation of an independent, sovereign Palestinian state under which the Palestinian people can enjoy the right of self-governance. In January of 2008, President George W. Bush traveled to Jerusalem where he met with Palestinian and Israeli leaders and he set forth what was and is American policy. And I quote President Bush, the point of departure for permanent status negotiations is clear. There should be an end to the occupation that began in 1967. The agreement must establish Palestine as a homeland for the Palestinian people just as Israel is a homeland for the Jewish people. These negotiations must ensure that Israel has secure, recognized, and defensible borders. And they must ensure that the state of Palestine is viable, contiguous, sovereign, and independent. It is vital that each side understands that satisfying the other's fundamental objective is key to a successful agreement. Security for Israel and viability for the Palestinian state are in the mutual interest of both parties. Israel has reached peace agreements in the past with Egypt and Jordan, both of which have endured for decades. The United States believes that an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians would be beneficial to both, although there are some in both societies who are opposed to a two-state solution. One beneficial result of such an agreement would be to remove a major obstacle to the normalization of relations between Israel and other Arab states with whom they share, particularly in the Gulf area, a fear of Iran and of its intentions. The Middle East is now and always ha been very complex. Consider the tangle of relations that the United States has in the region. We oppose the Assad regime in Syria, but we also oppose ISIS, which is fighting against the Assad regime. The Syrian Kurds join us in opposing ISIS, but they are being attacked by Turkey, one of our allies. We also combat ISIS in Iraq, where we are joined by Shia militia 
who are supported by Iran, whom we oppose. In Afghanistan, we oppose the Taliban, who receive support from Pakistan, one of our allies. Pakistan, meanwhile, has fought several wars with India, another of our allies. We are allied with Israel. We are also allied with many Arab and Muslim countries. For many decades, the United States has had close relationships with Morocco, with Turkey, with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, with Lebanon, with the United Arab Emirates, and many others. Of the seven and one half billion people in the world today, about one in four is Muslim, about 1.8 billion. Sometime after the middle of this century, around the year 2060, the total population of the world will pass 9 billion on its way to 10 billion. And at that time, one in three will be Muslim, or more than 3 billion. To put that into perspective, that was the total population of the world as recently as 1960. So in the 21st century, what happens in the Muslim world will affect everyone in the world, in particular, the dominant world power, the United States. The United States has a clear and compelling interest in remaining involved in the Middle East and doing all we can to help reduce violence and upheaval. Inevitably, there will be more years of disruption and no single policy or action or political leader can solve all of the region's problems. But a peaceful resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be a significant step that might enable some of the countries, in particular Israel and Saudi Arabia, to cooperate in opposing their common foes, Iran and terrorist organizations including those supported by Iran and those opposed by Iran. I recognize that for many there is little reason now to be optimistic about resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But my hope is that Israelis and Palestinians will weigh the risks of further delay or further inaction against the benefits of an agreement, however imperfect each of them might see it. I believe it is essential for the United States to lay out clear, balanced, and reasoned principles, and then to help create the right incentives to encourage Israelis and Palestinians to enter into serious negotiations in an effort to reach an agreement. As Anwar quoted me in the beginning, uh, I believe there's no such thing as a conflict that can't be ended. I am especially mindful of the many other conflicts and complexities in the region that work against an early resolution. I served two tours of duty in the Middle East under three American presidents, and I know how hard it can be. And yet, I believe that there is a path to peace between Israelis and Palestinians through a two-state solution. And I believe that all of us who care about the Middle East and its people, and in particular, Israelis and Palestinians, must do whatever we can to advocate and to work for an end to this seemingly endless conflict. Thank you all very much. Again, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll be glad now to take your questions. When I used to be a candidate for office, <laughs> and I appeared before crowds, when I got to the question answer period, I would ask everybody, please, just ask questions, don't make speeches. But now I'm not running for anything, so <laughs> if anybody would like to make a speech, be my guest and <laughs> say whatever you want. Thank you all very much. Good evening, everybody. At the very outset, I would like to say to Mr. Uh, Mitchell, welcome to my country, welcome to Morocco. Secondly, thanks very much indeed for this very interesting 
a talk that has addressed that very delicate matter, peace in the Middle East. Mr. Mitchell, to be frank with you, concerning Palestine, the US administration, successive administrations, were always biased and partial towards Israel against the cause of the Palestinians. This is the first one. And this considers tremendous threat to the peace in the area or in the region. Now let's move to say, yes. The threat, threat. Yeah. This behavior from, your, from the United States uh, successive administrations considers a threat against a peace in the region. The fact of being biased towards Israel against Palestinians, okay? Now let's move to Palestine. In Syria, as you have no, already known, Mr. Mitchell, there was a voices in the United States of America as well as in the region calling for increasing arms to the Syrian opposition or the establishment of no-fly zone or any other forms of intervention. But unfortunately, none of these proposals has or, or, or was heard. So the Syrian Pandora's box has been opened and it will not uh, close any time soon. That is why people in the region have always believed that United States had not and has no intention to stop this bloody assault by, 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 by Bashar Assad against innocent people, including women and the children. Mr. Mitchell, how could you comment on that? Thank you very much indeed, from the bottom of my heart. One of the, there are many benefits to being the dominant world power, as Rome once was, as Britain once was, and now as the United States is. There are also many disadvantages. One disadvantage is that every problem in the world is seen as an American problem. So when I travel in the Indian subcontinent and countries in that region, I tell this story about the Pakistani official who wakes up one morning in Karachi. He goes into the bathroom to take a shower. He turns the faucet, cold water. Ah, he says, no hot water. Obama, the CIA again. <laughs> the United States is not responsible for hot water in Karachi. And the United States is not responsible for every problem in the world. It does have, in my judgment, a self-interest in reducing conflict, in permitting the largest number of people to enjoy the benefits of freedom, self-governance, and broadly shared prosperity. But it cannot be the case that the United States bears sole responsibility for every problem in the world. I served in the Obama administration, but I believe President Obama's response in Syria was inadequate. At the same time, I recognize that no matter what he did, the United States could not by itself have resolved that problem. The people of Morocco decide Morocco's future. The people of the United States decide America's future. And it is the people of Syria who ultimately will decide their future. We can help, we can assist, we can encourage, we can especially provide assistance who share the values of openness, tolerance, general, broad, broadly shared prosperity. But we cannot by ourselves solve every problem in the world. Problems that go back thousands of years, long before the United States existed. Aleppo was the scene of slaughters four or five times in the last 2,000 years. Most of them occurred before the United States existed. It is a profound error 
for people around the world to assume that every problem in the world derives from the dominant power. That does not mean we should shirk our responsibility. So I think there's a balanced view. And I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to tell a story and ask you a question. I spoke in London two years ago, and the man was not nearly as polite as you. You were very polite. You made your comments fairly and openly. He delivered a blistering attack on the United States and on President Obama because he said 200,000 people have died in Syria. And the United States should have sent an army to invade Syria and separate the two sides. And so he said the blood is on the hands of President Obama of 200,000 people. Just that morning, I had read in the Financial Times, a newspaper in London, that in the Congo, in civil conflict in the previous 10 years, two and a half million people had died. And so I said to him, why, why aren't you, if 200,000 Syrians died and you denounced the United States, why have you not mentioned two and a half million people dying in the Congo? And before he could answer, an African American, uh, African man jumped up in London and he said, Senator Mitchell, you're wrong. I said, what did I say that's wrong? He said, it's not two and a half million, it's five million. And later, the CIA declassified a report that said the figure is five and a half million. Are you upset that five and a half million Africans have died? Has anybody here heard anyone complaining about that? Should the United States have intervened militarily in the Congo to try to prevent those deaths? Should we intervene in the Sudan? Should we intervene everywhere there is a conflict? What are standards or criteria are we to use? What number of deaths should be sufficient to draw an American military response? A hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand? These are very difficult issues. And there can be no doubt that as all human beings are fallible individually and all human institutions are fallible and make mistakes, that the United States has made mistakes in its policies in the region. But remember, the principal criticism of the George W. Bush administration was that it did intervene in Iraq. And the principal criticism of the Obama administration is that it did not intervene in Syria. So sometimes when you're in a position of power, you must recognize that you're going to be criticized if you do something and criticized if you don't do something. And the best answer is to try to figure out what is the fair and right thing to do? Now, let me address your question with respect to Israelis and Palestinians. The United States does indeed have a strong commitment to Israel's right to exist behind national borders. We also have a strong commitment to the creation of a Palestinian state. And while many in the Arab world criticize the United States, the United States is the largest source of financial assistance for the Palestinian people. When I was in the Middle East representing the United States, I spent much of my time going to all of the Arab countries asking them to provide support for the Palestinians. And I remember getting back to Ramallah one night and being told by one of the highest Palestinian officials, why is it that you Americans have to go around to the Arabs asking them to help the Palestinians. And I'd like to ask you that. Why is it that the Arabs, who are so critical of the United States, do not support the Palestinians to help them eat and live normal lives? I don't mean to be critical. I mean only to point out that it must be a shared responsibility. Now, to many in the Arab world, I've been in, I've been in every Arab country and in most Muslim countries, to many, the answer is very simple. Cut off aid to Israel and they'll do what you want. To many Israelis, the answer is very simple, the opposite way. 
you Americans are the principal source of support for Palestinians, you cut off aid to them and they'll do what you want. I believe that cutting off aid to either will not work. I believe they're both proud people and they will stand on their own, even if it means losing support if we take the position that we're going to cut them off. Instead, I believe the answer is, as with all human beings, offer positive incentives. I've just written a book on this subject, and I laid out a, a series of positive incentives that the United States can undertake to try to encourage the Palestinians and the Israelis to come together, to see that there will be a way to solve their problems. Historically, when peace agreements are reached, after they sign, then they try to figure out a way how to implement them. And actually, implementation is actually harder than getting the agreement. What I think we should do is to lay out incentives. I'll just give one example. <clears throat> there, are, there are millions of Palestinians who don't live in the area that we think of as Palestine or the territories. They're in camps in Syria, many of them in uh, Jordan and Iraq and other places. If there is ever an agreement, and I believe there will be, some mechanism has to be created to provide them with housing and a place to live and jobs and opportunity for their children. Instead of waiting until they get an agreement, I believe the United States should take the lead in creating a fund that would be used only for that purpose, but the existence of which would be to create an incentive. If people knew that once peace was achieved, they would have a decent home, they would live in a decent community, their children could go to school safely and get off to a good start in life, I believe they would put more pressure on their political leaders. And I believe they would see meaningful negotiation as a true path to peace. Now, there are many others. I don't, I don't want to read the whole book to you here, but I'm making the point that there are many who approach it as you did, that the only way to do it is to withdraw support from one side or the other. I think human nature is such the only way to do it is to create positive incentives to do things, to make them believe and see that there is a better life and future for them. As to your comment about bias toward Israel, that's very widely believed throughout the Arab and Muslim world. It's a way of, it's a way of uh, uh, I want to be polite how I say this, it's a way of rationalizing the lack of support that many of the Arab countries give to the Palestinians themselves, based, based, based it on United States bias. The United States has a completely open political system. Anybody can get in and campaign and argue and fight for their cause. And I, I, my mother was born in Lebanon, so I'm part Lebanese, half Lebanese. My father was from Ireland. I tell the people in Arab countries, if you don't like what's happening in American politics, tell the Arabs there to get organized and get involved in the political process. And don't just stand around and complain about Israel. That's, that's the way you, you engage in the political process to, to get your views accepted. I believe our policy now is a fair one, it's a sound one, and I think we have to work very hard to try to persuade both sides to go to peace, but they have to want it themselves. They must want it themselves. We cannot force people who don't want peace to get peace. We can encourage them to do it, but in the end, they must decide their own futures, just as you here from Morocco will decide the future of Morocco. Okay, um, thank you for your speech. Uh, that was very informative. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, we shouldn't blame the US for everything. Um, they're only working to secure their own interests and we should do the same. Um, but um, uh, I, I can't help but uh, notice that uh, when you talked about um, when you talked about uh, religious uh, religious tensions in Iraq, 
I can't help but notice that uh, it was after the invasion of Iraq by the U.S., but uh, that's not what um, um, uh, my question is, is about. Uh, my question is about uh, um, something else. I would like you to enlighten me about the interest of uh, Saudi Arabia and um, Gulf states in the Syrian conflict because I can understand the interest of Europe and the US, but I can seem to understand uh, why Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Gulf states are involved there. Thank you very much. I, I, you can't understand why Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are not involved or are involved in Syria? Are involved. Are involved, yes. Well, I'll answer the question and I'm gonna go back and make a comment on one of your earlier comments. Uh, uh, they are involved because it is a conflict between Sunni and Shia. It is a proxy conflict in which other countries are fighting their battles on someone else's soil. That's happened in Lebanon over a long period of time and it's happening in Syria today. Uh, the Assad family are from the Alawite sect, an offshoot of Shia, about 12% of the population. Sunnis comprise about 80% of the population. And the Sunnis feel that, and argue now, and fight on the grounds that they were discriminated against. And so you have Saudi Arabia, along with the other Gulf countries you mentioned, which are committed to the Sunni cause, fighting on one side, and Iran, which is committed to the Shia side, fighting on the other side. And I, I believe that is a contributing factor to the continuation of the conflict. Not the first time in history that's happened, and undoubtedly not the last. Secondly, I very respectfully, but I want to take issue with your making the argument that the religious differences in Iraq arose after the invasion of George W. Bush. I think that is a profound misreading of history. Have you forgotten what Saddam Hussein did to the Shia in Iraq? Have you forgotten that Saddam Hussein used poison gas to kill 5,000 Kurdish Iraqis? The notion that religious conflict in Iraq began after the Bush administration ignores all of the history of Iraq. In fact, when the British were there in the spring of 1920, a revolt occurred when a, a Sunni tribal leader located in Mosul, which is right now the scene of conflict, met, argued with, and personally stabbed to death the highest ranking British official in Iraq at the time. And that triggered an outbreak of the Sunni tribes of the North against the British. And, and a tribal leader today, the same tribe, the same name, the grandson of that tribal sheikh, was a leader in creating an alliance with ISIS in the North because of their opposition to the government in, in Baghdad, which they see as a Shia-controlled government. And ironically, when the Shia rose against the British in the north, uh, when the Sunnis arose against the British in the north, the Shia rose in Baghdad and the south. And the leader of the Shia revolt against the British was a tribal chief named Muqtada al-Sadr whose grandson of the same name and the same tribe is the leader of the Shia tribes today, opposing the Sunni in the north. So uh, respectfully, I say to you that while the American invasion of Iraq exacerbated and worsened the relations between Sunni and Shia, the notion that they created those divisions is completely contradicted by history. They were there for a long time. They were very fierce and many people died. And uh, you have to 
bear that in mind when you discuss what is occurring now. In order to answer the question that we uh, saw in the announcement of this debate about the possibility of, of peace in the Middle East. Okay. So, in order to answer the question that we saw in the announcement of this debate concerning the peace, the possibility of, pe of peace in the Middle East, and especially in the conflict between Israeli and Palestinians, there was officially 25 attempts and policy papers in order to ensure peace in that area, starting with the George Macti project in 49, John Foster Dallas in 55, and the recent one, which is the Hamas policy paper that we can find in the disc basket of Netanyahu. Uh, we're not gonna talk in about details, but I have a, a question that might look silly. Uh, as there is occupation in Palestine, don't you think that there, we cannot talk about peace while Israel is still occupying Palestine? Uh, the, the, the gist of the question is, how can we talk about peace in Palestine while Israel is still occupying Palestinian lands? Most Israelis do not accept that it is Palestinian land. That's the issue. There is a disagreement over whose land it is. And that disagreement is what must be resolved in negotiation. I, I don't think it's very complicated. You obviously disagree with the Israeli assertion. And many Israelis disagree with the Palestinian assertion. And that's the nature of the dispute that exists. So uh, it's quite clear that Israel is not going to withdraw in the absence of an agreement. You may wish that, that they would, but that is simply not going to occur. So what do you suggest as an alternative to negotiation under those circumstances? Well, I mean, if you take the position that there can be no negotiation until the Israelis accept the Palestinian position, then of course there'll be no negotiation. I mean, that's just the reality. I told Arafat many times, and I told Abbas many times, in 1947, the United Nations proposed a settlement which divided the region into two states and created an international regime in Jerusalem. Israel accepted, the Arabs rejected, and the first war began. Because there were only 600,000 Jews in what is now Israel then, and the Arab countries comprised tens of millions of people. And they believed that they could easily defeat the Jews and end the state of Israel just as it began. It was a profound miscalculation. Israel won that war and has won every war since. I said to Arafat and Abbas, you've been waiting 60 years. Well, first off, no reasonable Arab today would reject today, the opportunity that existed in 1947 and 1948. But it's gone. A mistake was made. They should have accepted it. They didn't. Circumstances have changed. Now you've been waiting for 60 years for the perfect solution to come about. The perfect solution as you describe, Israel withdraw. It hasn't happened, it won't happen for another 60 years. So you have to face the hard reality of choosing whether to not change circumstances or to get into a negotiation that will lead to the creation of a Palestinian state. Less than what you want, imperfect, as are all human outcomes, but a sovereign, independent state.
And that's the choice that has to be made. I, I, I accept in perfect good faith your argument. You think that they shouldn't do that. Don't negotiate until the Israelis withdraw, even as you know and recognize that will never happen. In the meantime, millions of Palestinians don't have the right of self-determination that all people should have. So I respect your position, but I think it's completely unrealistic. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, concerning what we're talking about, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you said you can encourage them to reach peace, but you can't make them peaceful if they don't want to. Assuming, for instance, um, I'm just saying, if you're in your home or bring you someone to live with temporarily, uh, sharing more than half of your house, then we blame you for not accepting them and wanting to, sh to reach peace with them. And I hope my opinion is not offending. offending. Thank you. Just the question is, uh, how would you feel if somebody came into your home and took half of it and, um, uh, and then you know, asked you to negotiate it with, with them? I wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Maine. Yeah, it's from Larry L Rubenstein. As a firm supporter of a two-state solution, I must ask, when you talk about the problem of occupied territories, who was the occupier prior to Israel in 1967, and when was there ever an independent Palestinian state? Prior to Jordan's occupation, the area was part of the British Palestinian mandate, and prior to that, part of the Ottoman Empire. When was it ever a state of Palestine? A two-state solution would create an independent state of Palestine for the first time. Could you comment? That's what the British argued in 1775. <laughs> Every state has to begin somewhere. The fact that there was not previously a Palestinian state, to me, is not an argument against there being a Palestinian state. There was never an Iraq before 1919. There was never a Jordan before 1919. Many of the states of Africa didn't exist with their national boundaries now before the 18th and 19th century. Uh, to me, that argument is really kind of the mirror image of the earlier argument made here about Departure. Now, there's an argument from someone who believes that there never has been a Palestinian state, so why should there ever be a Palestinian state, that the territory is that of Israel. It suggests that there are two very deeply held, very emotional points of view. And if you take the position that unless the other side accepts fully your point of view, before you will begin discussions, then you guarantee a continuation of the status quo. And the status quo is very unfavorable to the Palestinians. So my argument to Palestinian leaders, which they did not accept, is that the best interest of your people lies in getting into negotiations and reaching an agreement as best you can to create a state and, and don't repeat the era of the 1948 rejection. Senator Mitchell, um, at the University of New England, we believe in a global society and that our students are gonna be citizens in that going forward. There is a rise now of what's called nationalism or popul this, this populism that's coming about. I wonder, what do you feel the future may be for our students and in the coming century for them? We've talked a lot about history. What do you see coming? Uh, do we, are we a more global society or are we gonna separate ourselves again? Right. Uh, we are a global society and many of the problems arise from the process of globalization. There is widespread fear and anxiety uh, in many societies, including our own, the United States, over the loss of many thousands of jobs. And political arguments are made repeatedly suggesting that 
All job losses are the result of trade agreements and the growth in trade. There's some truth to it, but it's an incomplete description. The Industrial Revolution, which turned out to be one of the greatest turning points in all of human history, began 250 years ago in England. Machines were invented to replace men in the production of goods. And there was widespread fear and anxiety. There was violence and upheaval because people feared that there would be no work for the men. But over the decades that followed, a remarkable thing occurred. There was a dramatic increase in productivity, which reduced the price of many goods, which led to the creation of new products, new services, new jobs. So over that century, the whole society experienced a rise in the standard of living. It doesn't mean everybody benefited. Some did not. Those principles took hold most deeply in what is now the, what was then the newly created United States of America. And we, it propelled the United States to the forefront of nations in the world. But there are millions of Americans who feel that they are not beneficiaries of this increase. They're victims. When you combine globalization and trade across national borders with the technological revolution that once again threatens jobs everywhere and has dramatically changed our lives. Almost every human being on earth has had the daily patterns of life transformed by the invention of a single instrument, the smartphone. And think of the other changes. The combination of those two has led to many people benefiting the amount of wealth that's been created is more than ever in human history, but the wealth is not being distributed throughout the whole societies. It's increasingly being concentrated in a few people at the very top in each society, and many people are victims. But look, most of the losses of jobs throughout human history, I'll limit it to the United States, that's what I know best, are not the result of trade agreements. They're the result of dynamic, innovative changes in a free market economy. There once was in Maine, where our university is located, and in other New England states, a small but thriving industry in which men worked to manufacture stagecoaches and other horse-drawn carriages. And every, there isn't a person employed in that now in the United States because the automobile was invented. No rational person would argue that our country is worse off because of the automobile, but for the men who lost their jobs in the production of stagecoaches, to their families, to their small communities, they were badly harmed and they were left behind. That's replicated on a huge scale now and that's why you have millions of Americans who are persuaded by an argument that we should try to return to the past, that we should try to recreate the society that existed 50 or 100 or 200 years ago. But we all know that can't happen. Not one of us will ever live a minute of our lives in the past. Every day of our lives will be lived in the future. And we have to figure out a way to preserve the benefits that come from technological change, to use the miracle of science, the knowledge that we are acquiring. More knowledge has been created in the past two decades than the previous 2,000 years as we begin to understand much more about human life and what we can do to it. And now we know so much about, uh, so about disease, all many other problems that we can solve problems that people couldn't previously solve. We have to harness that, not deny science, not try to go backward, but we have to help those who are left behind, and that means better education, more skill, and adapting to the changes of the 21st century, not trying to build walls or go backward. We have to mean open societies, more opportunity, more education, more knowledge, more skill, more tolerance.
That, to me, is the way of the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you all very much. A great uh, pleasure to be here. It's, uh, you have a beautiful, beautiful city and country here, and I wish you all very well, and thank you for being such nice hosts to our beloved University of New England. Thank you all very much. Thank you.